Every night when a clone trooper goes to sleep, he finds himself revisiting the same nightmare. He enters a world of fog and shadow, all at once familiar and terrifying. All around him the dins of battle echo, the screams of dying men, and the groans of warping metal. The clone trooper cannot see the faces of the phantoms around him, and so he feels alone despite being lost in a sea of bodies. Although he fears what lies ahead, he finds himself being pulled continuously forward by some mysterious power. If he does not complete this mission, then all those who have been lost along the way will have died in vain. This wasn't just the dream that one clone had. It's the shared nightmare and experience that every clone trooper went through when he laid down and closed his eyes. The clone troopers were genetically altered to be loyal and brave soldiers, but they were also conditioned against their own will to put the mission above all else. This overrode their individual fear and self-preservation. This made every clone a hero. Today, we pay respects to 10 clones who finally were able to escape this nightmare while honoring their commitment to their fellow brothers. Gregor wasn't just a regular clone. He was a clone commando, a bioengineered killing machine designed to survive and function deep behind enemy lines. Like any clone who's lived to an old age, Gregor has seen almost everyone close to him die. Yet for one reason or another, it doesn't stop him from continuing to fight. After the Republic collapsed, Gregor was once again called upon to fight for freedom, this time against the Imperial occupation of Lothal. During the final battle for the planet, Gregor is a part of a team that attempts to raise a large city-wide shield generator to protect Lothal's capital city from bombardment. He shot during this mission and mortally wounded, but he still manages to hold on long enough to kill his attacker and say goodbye to his old friend Rex. It was an honor to fight with you for something that we chose to believe in. Gregor didn't need to be at this battle. He could have lived the rest of his life in peace on Silos, hunting gigantic jubas. But he ultimately volunteered for a cause he believed was right and for the people he cherished. In the early days of the Galactic Civil War, the Republic was overwhelmed by multi-pronged separatist attacks in the Outer Rim. The clone army was spread thin and outnumbered on every battlefield they decided to engage the enemy on. Clone Captain Keeley was posted on Ryloth, the home world of the Twi'leks. This was a long neglected world full of neglected people, and now the Twi'leks were trying their best to stay alive and flee the separatist droid army's invasion. Captain Killy and Jedi General Imon Gundi are fighting a losing battle. For every droid they destroy, another 10 replaces it. They continue to pull back in a strategic retreat, and Captain Keeley and Imon Gundi remain in the rear guard. They do their best to hold a line against the encroaching Separatist forces, but eventually, they too are overwhelmed and overrun. Captain Keeley dies standing next to Imon Gundi, surrounded by the dead. Their sacrifice has brought the Twi'lek refugees enough time to rendezvous with Republic supply ships so that they can live and grow strong and fight for another day. This is Republic blockade runner 0990. We have broken through. Well, I believe that Order 66 was completely justified given the fact that the Jedi attempted a coup and tried to overthrow the democratically elected Sith Lord Chancellor Palpatine. I wholeheartedly disagree with the practice of putting biochips into the heads of the clones in order to enforce the will of the Chancellor onto them. It's barbaric, authoritarian, and the clones deserve better. These biotrips were incredibly effective and were even able to control the minds of strong-willed individuals like Captain Rex. One clone known as CC-10-994 Gray was somehow able to fight off the influence of the chip without even having it removed from his head. Gray was a clone commander who served alongside Jedi Master Deepa Bilaba's battalion. He had grown close to his Jedi Master and her apprentice Caleb Doom. Gray was with Master Deepa and Caleb on the planet of Collar when Order 66 was executed. Gray would order his men to kill both of the Jedi. Master Deepa Baliba would sacrifice herself in order to give her Padawan a chance to escape. Commander Gray would shoot her in the back. 
Gray and clone Captain Styles would continue searching for Padawan Caleb Doom the next several days in Plateau City on Kaler. They would eventually capture Caleb Doom, and the young Padawan would try his best to convince the two clones that they had all been betrayed by Palpatine. Caleb's attempts were unable to convince them, but he bought himself enough time to open up an airlock and escape from the clones with the help of some underworld scum he had met while on the run. Captain Stiles orders the Gazanti class freighter they're on to pursue the criminals, but Caleb's words had an effect on Commander Gray. The clone commander began wondering why he and the clone so blindly obeyed Order 66 and murdered the Jedi who they had so much respect for. It was almost as if they had lost their own free will. And so, before the Imperial freighter is able to take out Caleb's ship, Commander Gray opens fire on the control console of his own ship, which lowers the shields, allowing Caleb and his friends to destroy them. Because of Commander Gray's sacrifice, Caleb Doom would live, and he would have a massive impact on the future of the galaxy. Technically, all clones are supposed to be the same. And technically, because then you have 99. The goddamn Kaminoan Dolphinkin probably pulled the wrong lever when they were making 99, and so he came out a bit defective. Now, from what we know about the Kaminoans, they generally took guys like 99 and recycled them. You know, turn individuals they didn't like into protein paste and stuff. The Kaminoans were from a famine culture. Which is why I sort of believe the fact that 99 is alive is sort of some kind of PR image thing that the Kaminoans are doing to assure the rest of the clones that they aren't in fact turning defective clones into protein bars because that would be bad for morale. But no, genetics be damned, 99 doesn't really see his physical defects as a limitation. While his body might be broken, 99's brain and heart are in the right place. Actually, I don't know where his heart is because we aren't really given details about his defect, but the point is he is a true hero and a very selfless individual. He not only cleans up after the clone cadets, he also helps mentor them. He helps them find appreciation in the simpler things in life. And when the Separatists attack Kamino and try to destroy the cloning facilities, 99 risks his life multiple times, running back and forth ferrying ammunition and explosives to his brothers. Towards the end of the battle, 99 falls in with a small group of survivors, including several clone cadets. They're pinned down in one of the barracks by a large separate destroyed force. When the clones run out of EMP grenades to throw, 99 once again springs into action to retrieve more, but sadly gets gunned down from behind. 99 reminds us to not dwell on which cards we are dealt with at the beginning of our lives. Instead, focus on what we can do with what we are given. Amongst the many clones that were watched over by 99 was CT-782. While all clones looked the same, Heavy was a bit broader and stronger than most. He also seemed to enjoy explosives firing from the hip and soloing what should have been a squad service weapon. While Heavy initially struggled to fit in with his fellow brothers and his training squad, with the help of 99, he finally understood the important connection he shared with his brothers, and he goes from being a lone wolf to the leader of his squad. Heavy's first posting was on the moon of Rishi, at a very important Republic listening post. The post guarded the only hyperspace lane that had access to Kamino. If the Separatists were going to attack the clone home world, they would have to come here first and silence this post. Which is exactly what they do. A team of Separatist droid commandos infiltrate the post and quickly take it over. The clone troopers take several casualties in the opening minutes of the battle, but manage to regroup outside. They realize that they must now destroy the outpost, which would cut off the all-clear signal going to Republic Central Command. If they are successful, it will alert the Republic Navy the Separatists are trying to invade their home world. Heavy and his team managed to retake the outpost, but the detonator for the explosives they want to use malfunctions, and so Heavy decides to stay behind and take out as many Separatist droids as possible before detonating the Tabana gas bomb they made. Heavy dies in this fiery blast. He not only saves his fellow squadmates, but all the clones training on his home world.
Clone Arc Trooper Colt was the commander of Rancor Battalion. He was also present that fateful day when the Separatist Alliance decided to attack the clone homeworld of Kamino. Colt bravely defends Tipica City alongside his clone brothers during the surprise attack. Even though his men are outnumbered, he managed to fight a delaying action that most likely saved many clone cadets' lives. While the planet had a large garrison of soldiers on it at the time, there were also entire barracks full of young clones who were not yet ready for combat. Commander Colt would try his best to protect his younger brothers in the face of monsters like Cyborg General Grievous, but ultimately he is no match for the Force and gets impaled by a size Ventress. His death was one of many, but it was a good death and an honorable death. Commander Colt would die defending the future of his beloved clone army. A while back, a small little boy named Anakin Skywalker pulled off one of the most famous starfighter maneuvers in history. He flew a tiny N1 starfighter into a Trade Federation control ship and detonated its core, ending the entire invasion of Naboo. Decades later, the men of the 501st would learn about Anakin's old shenanigans and would be inspired to carry out their own Skywalker-like maneuver. Three troopers of the 501st, Hardcase, Jesse, and Fives, decide to take captured unbarned starfighters and infiltrate the Separatist fleet that was currently engaged against the Republic over Umbara. Three clone troopers manage to make it inside a Separatist battleship, but unfortunately, they're unable to penetrate the ray shields with their energy weapons, and so Hardcase decided to take matters into his own hands. He disengages one of the weapon pods on his fighter and walks it right through the ray shield and rams the pod straight into the reactor. Hardcase faces his death and sacrifice with a smile on his face. His actions are enough to give the Republic forces the upper hand in the orbital battle of Umbara. Commander Thorne of the Coruscant Guard wasn't expecting combat when he and several other shock troopers were assigned to a diplomatic mission with Senator Padme Amidala to the financial world of Scipio. And so when the Separatists carried out a surprising attack on his men while they were exposed on the landing pad of the IGBC main vault building, Commander Thorne only had seconds to warn Senator Amidala of what was happening before trying to organize a hasty defense. Unfortunately, his men were cut off and exposed out in the open. The enemy Separatist commando droids were dropped right on top of them alongside air support. Commander Thorne didn't stand much of a chance. Any normal individual would have dropped his weapon and surrendered, but Commander Thorne and his men fought to the bitter end. Thorne would be the last one to go down, and he would go down just like Heavy, firing a rotary blaster cannon from the hip at endless waves of droids. Clone Arc Trooper 5 served the Galactic Republic well until the very end, that is. His distinguished service history is marred by a failed assassination attempt on Chancellor Palpatine and an attempted kidnapping of Jedi General Anakin Skywalker and Clone Captain Rex. That's at least what the official records say, but what really happened was Fives discovered the Secret Order 66 plot and the biochips that were designed to make the clone troopers obey that order. Towards the end, Fives was confused and drugged by that treacherous Kaminoan scientist, but still he fought through the haze and tried to get the truth out to someone he trusted. Although he ultimately failed to convince Anakin Skywalker and the Jedi about the Order 66 conspiracy, he did manage to at least warn Captain Rex about what was happening. And so when the good captain comes under the spell of the biochip, he's ready to fight against it. Five's warning probably saves Captain Rex's life along with the life of Ahsoka Tano. If only more people had believed it. This list honestly should be full of the exploits of clone commandos. These heroic soldiers clad in guitar and armor were expected to take on some of the most dangerous missions the Grand Army of the Republic could think up. But so little is known about their missions and the ones who were left behind. RC-1207, Sev, was officially registered as MIA during the Battle of Kashyyyk. He was a member of Delta Squad and specialized as a sharpshooter. Although Sev was considered a ruthless individual with a grim sense of humor and mild psychopathic tendencies, he was an extremely reliable squad mate. During one of Delta Squad's missions to Kashyyyk, Sev was left in the rear guard position and suddenly overwhelmed by enemy forces. 
Delta Squad received orders to exfil from Grandmaster himself, leaving Sev behind. We don't exactly know what happened to Sev. It's said that the developers of the Republic Commando games did have him survive in the cancelled sequel to this game. Apparently, Sev was supposed to be the progenitor of the Rebellion Army or something. Anyway, the point is Sev being left behind to fend for himself at the behest of Jedi officers is one of the main reasons why so many clone commandos disliked the Jedi. But Sev never held a grudge about being left behind. He understood that the larger mission was at stake. And more importantly, he didn't want to endanger the rest of his squad mates. That is what is expected of a clone commando. So we did a little something different today in this video. I hope you guys enjoyed it and pressed F multiple times because, you know, pay respects. Also, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content here on Generation Tech.